Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm your co-host. My name is Seth Ressler. And I'm Becky Scarcello. And this is the show where we meet the creatives who are shaping Detroit. Becky, let's talk today about a question that I know a lot of local artists and entertainers uh, really start with at their career, which is how do I take what I'm doing? How do I take my art form, my craft that I love and make a living doing it? Yes. How do I make money? How do I quit my day job? Right. Because they love it. You know, it's been a passion, but they also like paying their bills and they got to figure out how to do that. Mm -hmm. I I feel like so many artists at the beginning of their career get stuck in that trap where they just go from gig to gig and they're taking a gig just because it pays something. Mm -hmm. Right. And they can never really get ahead and turn it into a sustainable, predictable you know, revenue generating enterprise. So we're going to talk about how to do that today. Our topic is how artists can turn their hobbies into sustainable businesses. And our guest is a woman who uh, helps not only artists and entertainers do that, but brands as well. She has consulted brands like GE, Intel, Twitter. She has her own business. It's called Brave by Design. She also hosts a uh, podcast by the same name, which is very popular. I want to welcome to the show today, Laura Khalil. Thanks for joining us. Hey, Laura. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. It um, is uh, a pleasure to be here. I know that artists kept us really alive and humming during the early days of the pandemic. And like you said, um, it is so important that we figure out how to be fairly compensated for our work, yes. how to turn our hobby into a job. And I'm here to talk all about it. Absolutely. So I'm going to jump to something Seth alluded to, the gig. So a yeah. lot of creatives get in that kind of just cycle, gig to gig to gig. And it almost holds them back from really having a strategy. Why Why is that? That's because a lot of people, because we're passionate, right? We're passionate about what we do. Our art is our creativity. It's the way that we express ourselves. And in doing that, we're just often so grateful to get the next gig that we don't think of it as a business. We're too reactive and not proactive enough. And so One of the first things that artists are wise to begin to think about is what actually do I want to do with this? Like what, like, let's put a number down. What are the financial goals you want to have? This is where I start with all of my creatives, no matter where they are, like what, if you want to make it a job, if you want to make it like get paid to go play or get paid to do the things that you love, what would you like to make doing it? Let's start with that. And then from there, move on to, and who do you want to serve and what problems do you solve? Now, you may be as an artist listening to that thinking, Laura, I just play music. (laughs) And I'm going to say, actually, no, you don't just play music. What you do is way bigger than that. Artists help people feel alive. They help people feel joy. They are there on some of the most profound and special days and moments and rites of passage in our lives. Beyond just the gig, from our weddings, to our family reunions, to our bar and bat mitzvahs, to all of these really special moments that we have, we have music at those. We have creativity at those. So when I ask, who do you serve? When I talk about what goals do you have for your business? I really would encourage everyone, if you want to start thinking about this as a viable career, start thinking about what target market you actually want to go after. So do you want to go after the wedding market? Do you want to go after the corporate event market, which is very lucrative? Um, Do you want to go after, um, you know, special events in people's lives like bar and bat mitzvahs? I even have a friend, um, his entire business is based on writing what he calls power songs for people. They are, he's a, he's a well-traveled artist and his entire career, he said, listen, I don't want to go play shows anymore. I don't want to do gigs anymore. But what I want to do now is I want to write songs that help people feel uplifted in their lives. He writes you a personalized song. There are so many ways to think about target market and think about what you do, but it starts with getting much more specific about who you want to serve and what problems you're solving for them. That is so, so on point. So you talk about target market, you talk about um, your niche, really defining your niche and who you are. Yeah. And so talk a little bit about how that's important as well as not being everything to everyone. Yeah, it's also important right. to know so, what you are not. Exactly. If And 
you know, a lot of people can be very resistant to picking a target market. So a target market is just simply the group of people that you want to serve. Uh, it could be companies you want to serve. It could be a, the types of events you want to be at. Um, and when you are known as the person, who, I'm, let's use weddings because it's an easy one. If you are known as the person who does weddings and your niche is, let's say you have a string quartet and you do amazing, uh, like sort of renditions of classical music, let's say updated renditions of classical music, very niche, right? Like very specific. And you do those very specific things at weddings for people who are probably, um, you know, very cultured, probably wanting something that is very high end. You're probably one of the only people who does that. And what that means is that when people hear about you, And they say, this person does weddings. And oh my gosh, you've never heard anything like this. It suddenly makes you highly referable. And the lifeblood of any creatives business is referable business. So that none of us love doing sales and marketing. Am I right? Like no creative is like, you know, I just, I love to like put down the drums for a day and just like cold call people. (laughs) Nobody wants to do that. And so the way that we actually stop doing the things we don't like and we minimize sales and marketing is by maximizing our specificity of who we actually serve and how we serve them. I know it can sound strange to people, but it makes you so referable. People will remember you. They will know you as that amazing group. And it makes it really easier to get booked. You know, it's so funny that you say that Uh, years ago, I was a struggling entrepreneur and I was in one of these leads groups, you know, where everybody meets uh, on a Wednesday morning for bagels and there's one plumber in the group and one real estate agent group and, you know, one of this in the group and they all exchange leads. They say, oh, I found somebody who's looking for this. You should go call them. And what I was doing with my business was not well-defined. And, and it was very, it was like, well, I can kind of do a little bit of this or I can do that or I can do that. And I never got any leads because it was yeah. exactly what you're saying. It was not specific, right? Nobody people knew what want, you did. And people want to refer you. They yeah. want to help you. They, everyone, listen, everyone looks good. When you say, I know just the person for you, you have this problem, I know who can solve it. You look good as the person who's referring out. So it sucks when we can't refer someone. But to your point, Seth, if we don't know what you do, or or if you say, I play music, I literally have no idea if you're in your parents' basement playing music, or if you're like doing shows, I don't know what type of music you play. I don't know if you're like some retro hair band. I don't know. Like, I don't know. What's your, what's your jam? Like, tell me what's your jam. And then I can probably think of people who would love that. But I don't, if you're not clear and you don't express it to people and you don't say, here are the problems I solve. And by that, I mean, here are the moments I help people experience that they're not going to get otherwise it can be very hard to refer out. And, you know, I just want to mention one more thing, which is professionalism because we're all entrepreneurs. We run our own businesses. And I just want to say to my creatives, how easily and quickly you will stand out from the pack if you are responsive to emails, if you have a clear rate that you express, if you show up on time, if you follow up with the customer after the event. I'm telling you these very small things are not done often enough. And if you show a little bit of professionalism, it goes a really long way in getting referred and booked again. I think that's so true. And you don't have to worry about your creativity not coming through. People appreciate both. So that's great. Um, Something I wanted to ask you about. I saw you referred to a red velvet rope policy. Can you tell us what that is and why we need one? Okay. So everyone needs a red velvet rope policy. And what that means is there are some people that you are meant to work with and others not so much. And a red velvet rope policy helps to define the people who we are going to let into our proverbial club. So what I mean by that is I don't mean the type of companies that you're looking for. I don't mean target market. I mean, literally, what are the personality characteristics of the people you're excited to do business with? Are they friendly? Are they eager to pay you what you're worth? Um, 
do you agree with their political affiliation, if that's important to you? Uh, do you like that they may be current or former musicians or artists themselves? Whatever those personality characteristics are, you want to look for those. And if someone doesn't meet your red velvet rope policy, this can be kind of hard for people, but I encourage you to not work with them. Because when a client, as we all know, is a complete nightmare, what what actually ends up happening is we don't do our best work because we hate being at the gig. We hate the show. We just want to get out of there. And when we don't do our best work, that comes across. We're not referable. It doesn't work. It's a vicious cycle. So I'd rather people get into a more virtuous cycle of working with people they really like, who really appreciate them. They do a great job and uh, they get referred. You know, I'll never forget the first time that somebody told me this and it was blew my mind when they said you can fire a client. Oh, yes. You can say no. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. It's powerful though. Yeah. Yeah. Say no. These are your peers. Your clients are not better or worse than you. They are your peers and you are engaged in just an exchange of goods and services. That's all that's going on here. And I, I encourage everyone to not think of the quote unquote boss as someone who's like above you or better than you. You're here to do a job. They're here to do a job and you have to meet sort of mano y mano, so to speak. You know, you know, I'll never forget the first time that I figured this out. It blew my mind. Somebody told me that you could fire your clients. Oh my gosh. The out. power of being able to say no. Yes. Yeah. yeah talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think that a lot of times when we think that someone's holding the purse strings, that we are beneath them or below them, or that we, you know, have to do whatever they say. In fact, it's really much wiser to see your clients as your peers. You're really on the same level. You're just exchanging goods and services. You want what they have. They want what you have. And so we come together as equals we come together as peers. And if you are working with people who are not treating you that way, or they're treating you really poorly from the get go, I'm telling you what, get out. They are going to be a nightmare. And you love playing music. You love being creative. So why would you put yourself in situations where your creativity is tamped down and boxed in by somebody who can't even appreciate it? That's going to make you hate your work. That's why we have the red velvet rope policy to find people you love to work with and to only work with people you love because it helps you do better work, helps you express your creative gifts more fully, and it helps you become more referable. Yeah, back to those referrals. So another thing a lot of people talk about is hustle. Well, I'm just a hustler. I'm hustling. I'm doing this and that. You are anti-hustle. Explain. (laughs) So anti hustle. I think it is a terrible concept. I think hustling is truly wearing people down, creating so much stress, anxiety, and overwhelm. Nobody feels like they can turn off because they have to hustle. It's been glorified in our culture. The fact is, when I work with clients, I teach them a system for how to actually get book solid with predictable monthly revenue, working with clients they love in 30 minutes a day. Can you imagine having a system where it's like, oh, I just need to spend 30 minutes a day working on this business. I don't need to spend 12 hours uploading constantly to Instagram or, you know, like putting like a million things on Facebook all the time. I can actually follow a system that really works and it doesn't kill me. Uh, that that's great advice. Laura, I, I do want to ask you one more thing. We've got uh, a question that we ask every single person who comes on the show. Uh, and so we want to ask you as well. Here we go. All right. Laura Khalil of Brave by Design. Name a Detroit creative that everyone should know. My favorite Detroit creative is the Pink Flamingo, which is a food truck that is located in Corktown. They set up shop on Thursdays in this grassy field. It is a beautiful place to experience both music, creativity, community, and wonderful food. I recommend anyone enjoy it during the fairer months of the year. It is such a treat that we have it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming by the show. Uh, We should mention that in addition to the podcast, which everybody can listen to, which is called Brave by Design, you also have over at uh, bravebydesign.net a uh, quiz that people can take that will help them figure out basically whether they're going to get regular predictable revenue coming in. And this is really – it gets – 
artists and entertainers out of that gig to gig trap that we were talking about. So uh, people can go over there and check it out. Thank you so much for uh, taking a few minutes to join us. Hey, thank you both for having me. It's been a pleasure. That's it for us here at The Debrief. I'm Seth Ressler. I'm Becky Scarcella. I want to remind you there's a lot of places that you can find the show, including Apple Podcasts, including Spotify. Uh, episodes are up on YouTube as well. That's it for us. Until next time, Detroit's moving. Keep up. 